desperate first because they're the easiest part mathematically to reveal. But if we had the exact techniques from the get-go, we probably would not have singled out strings as the one entity by which we named the structure. So yes, that's one of the big developments, and that has suggested a whole other way of thinking about the theory. Yeah, it may, it may, it, it, if it, it may provide a, a slight hope of, a, of an observational signature, as we'll get to in a second. Yes. But before we get to the possibilities, uh, what, what do you say to people, not me, of course, but what would you say to people who would say that string theory has fallen on hard times? Whoever, I, someone asked me to ask that question. <laughs> You, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great question, especially because no doubt some people here are aware that some books were written not too long ago which tried to make a case of, of that particular sort. And what I would strongly emphasize is that the bread and butter of science and the exciting part about physics is you go forward into the unknown and sometimes there are very fertile periods when there are huge numbers of breakthroughs and your understanding is just leaping forward. There are other times when the theory surprises you in ways that make you step back and really reevaluate and think about things. Now, a theory falls on hard times when neither of those two things are happening, when it yeah. stagnates. Yeah. And we are nowhere near stagnation. We are in a period where we are reevaluating and trying to take all the things that have been discovered and find how to best organize them so that we can gain the deepest understanding of this theory. But because there is this progress, this steady progress, we feel the theory is quite healthy, but perhaps going in directions that were unanticipated. If you view it in that light, I think the theory is not fallen on hard times per se. If you view it, has the theory achieved the goals that it has set for itself? No, not yet. Not yet. I mean, there, that was part of the problem. There were some yep. pretty lofty goals set in the 1980s that as if, made it seem as if by the time uh, you know, you had gray hair. Um, the, the, uh, 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 the, uh, and I was losing mine, just to make, uh, but uh, that, that the theory would be solved, yes. that we'd know everything. I mean, there were claims made in the, in the 1980s. It were, they were, the important thing to know is, that, as you know, those were not malicious claims, yeah. nor were they claims coming from some sense of trying to hype. Yeah. It was really coming from a place of excitement. Excitement, I think. You know, right. again, you know, during that period, it was so wonderfully exciting. In, in, in the 1980s, you know, early 90s, there was this real sense that this is going to take us the final step to the deepest understanding. And look, the well-seasoned researchers knew at that point, calm down, everybody. Yeah. You know, this may be an interesting development, but it's bound to be hard to get it to a conclusion. One of the ways when can this, and I, I don't know the answer to this particular question, one of the ways you can try and judge um, you know, how a theory is doing is where students are going. And in fact, we, on, on stage once, uh, when, when we were having a debate, one of my colleagues uh, bemoaned the fact that the, the good students were going to string theory. And, and you pointed out rightly, I think, that students vote with their pe feet. And, uh, and if what's exciting is what students go into. And so it was a good sign that the good students were going to string theory. Is that changing at all? Is, I mean, are, are there more students doing other things? Is it harder to get students to work on string theory at all? No, certainly. I mean, my experience is no. But I have certainly encountered students, and maybe it's because of my particular research focus of late has been more at the interface of string theory and cosmology. I tend now to attract students that want to work in that domain, that are not working on, on pure, pure string theory per se, but trying to use the theory to gain some contact with observational data. But I think that in terms, if you were to do a survey, I think that it's quite similar to what it was years ago in terms of you know, the most theoretically oriented students see this as an opportunity to make the biggest possible contribution, which of course means the biggest possible risk. Yeah. That's how science works. It's risk. Now, I don't want to belabor this, the last question in this yeah. regard, but, but what would, what if anything would cause you to stop working on this and, and work in a new dire direction? You, you know, if you started to work on it, you know, that, I, then you I, want, I, that's I, right. just, you know, something that's must right. be wrong. Well, it's, yeah, when it no. it snows in <laughs> Phoenix, I guess. But, um, now, uh, what would stop me from working on it? I guess, I uh, guess I'm still working on cosmology, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Which I'm yeah. thrilled by. Yeah. Uh, if, 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 for instance, two things I can imagine, and this is quite possible, somebody comes along, maybe it's some new student, looks at the theory and says, you guys have missed a fundamental inconsistency, a fundamental mathematical flaw that is absolutely insurmountable that would be enough to say, okay, we, we have to let this go. And I should say, that has almost happened periodically in the history of the subject, 
But people then looked harder, and the math actually worked when you... And by the way, I should say, that's the kind of confidence, that, that's interesting, because that's the kind of thing that drives you further when you think something's going to be wrong and you find out, boy, the mathematics solves things. I'm, as a theoretical physicist, that does give you more confidence that there's something right about the theory. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, there was this anomaly having to do with, you know, Yang Mills' degrees of freedom that trace F squared had to be equal to trace R squared, which to came to a total... Ron, I just want to see if they can type this out. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> Okay, you can, uh, yeah, that's close, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not bad, not, not, well, uh, it's falling off a little bit here, yeah. Actually, I think, now, we, now are we going to get into like some endless loop right here, if I actually read what's yeah, on, it is, the, on we the are. So, going so I'm going to, yeah, uh, okay, yes, yeah, okay. Okay. Actually, string loops, but, but yeah, actually, there, there actually I think the way he wrote the equation down was right, I think he may have discovered something. <laughs> there but, it is, yeah. but, um, but the second thing, back to your question, is if a better theory came along, I mean, mm -hmm. what we are constantly doing is, we are looking at the landscape of possibilities, and if somebody came along with a newer idea that we're like, wow, that, that maybe retains some of what we've done in string theory, but takes it to a place that uh, gets rid of a lot of the problems that we were encountering, but that's the kind of thing that would make you drastically shift your focus. Now, okay, now, do, I, I hate when people ask me this question, but I'm, and, but I'm gonna frame it. In a, in a, Cause you, well, the, the question is sort of where do you think the, People often ask, where's the next great breakthrough? And, and I always say, if I knew, I'd be working on it. So let me just put it, not put it that way. But where do you think the most fruitful direction in string theory is right now that may, that may have the greatest payoff? Well, I, I do think that the connection to cosmology ha has great potential. I mean, if you're going to test this theory, there are two ways. Either you test it in an accelerator, you slam things together, and we can talk about what, that, yeah. what might happen. It's be or you test it through astronomical observations, making use of the fact that the universe itself, we like to say, is itself a giant particle accelerator because the early universe was very energetic, very hot. Things happen there that might be sensitive to the exotic physics that we're talking about. So potentially, the imprint of that exotic physics might still be with us in astronomical data. So that's where my focus has been for a number of years. And look, we've done some calculations that suggest maybe in the microwave background radiation there could be a signal. When we first did the work, it seemed quite exciting to me. As we looked further, it began to feel a little bit fine-tuned and, and, and less an absolute yeah. consequence of string theory. So who knows? Maybe they'll find something. Mm. But again, if they don't, it won't rule the theory out. So yeah. it doesn't quite reach the, the, the level that we want. But I, I should say uh, that when I came in started being a research physicist just a few years earlier than you, it was a similar idea. That's one of the reasons I got involved in cosmology. At the time, it was something called grand unification. The unification of the non-gravitational forces required a great leap, not quite as great leap as string theory, but still a very great leap from where the experiments were. And it seemed to me that the universe, and, and that's what makes the universe exciting, one of the things is that because it's growing, at early times it was smaller, hotter, much more energetic. And so at early, early times, there were energies that you could never achieve on Earth in a terrestrial accelerator that were there, and so the universe is a big, a big particle physics device in a sense, and that's really what got me interested in cosmology early on too. Sure, if you don't mind, another analogy just to amplify that idea because I think it's a very potent one. If you, if you have a, a balloon with no air inside of it and you have a really fine tip pen and you write a little message on the surface of a balloon, you know, it'll be too small for you to see, but then if I blow air into the balloon, it stretches out my little scribble into something that perhaps you can clearly read. So the idea is that the early universe might be affected by these little tiny strings, if string theory is correct, or even the physics of grand unification yeah. in some way. And that little imprint of the exotic physics is too small to be seen, and there was presumably nobody there to see it anyway. But then through 14 billion years of cosmic expansion, the message of string theory, if you will, gets smeared out across the sky, like my little scribble on the balloon gets smeared out across the expanding surface. So if you know what to look for, or so this approach suggests, you could see the imprints of exotic physics out there in astronomical data. And, and let me say, I mean, well, while that may or may not be the case, that, that tradition has worked, and I'll, I'll show some pictures later today, but we use that. One of the reasons that actually one of the people who recently won the Nobel Prize for discovering small hot spots and cold spots in the microwave background is that we think, we definitely think they do provide a signature of a of another process that happened very early in the history of the universe. So, so, and, and you'll see pictures of it. So it's a, tr it's a tradition that's a noble one, and whether we'll, we'll get to the level you want, we don't, no one knows at that's this point. Right. But let's talk about that. We, we mentioned it a few times, uh, the, the, the inklings of the, of, of potential.